David Albert, and it's my pleasure that you're here. David, many, many thanks Thank for, for accepting our invitation. It's Thank you. It's really great to have you in Argentina. Mm. And the title is just the same as the workshop, but the other way around. <laughs> the time from the whole universe to local systems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, forgive me for being low-tech and old-fashioned. I only have two slides, and I find that if I don't write the talk out and read it, I forget 50% of what I want to say. So, uh, so have pity on an old man and, and forgive me for all that. Okay. <clears throat> Our everyday macroscopic experience of being in the world is saturated with asymmetries, thermodynamic asymmetries, and radiative asymmetries, and epistemic asymmetries, and phenomenological asymmetries, and asymmetries of overdetermination, and asymmetries of influence, and what have you, between the past and the future. And there's a long cherished hope, something that has its origins in the work of Boltzmann and which has been pursued by any number of other investigators through any number of fits and starts and revelations and wrong turns ever since. Um, there's a hope, that is, that all of those asymmetries can ultimately be traced back to some relatively simple characteristic of the initial macro condition of the universe. The thought, as people put it nowadays, is that all we need to do in order to account for these asymmetries is to add to the fundamental time reversal symmetric dynamical laws and to the standard statistical mechanical probability measure over the space of possible fundamental physical states, a simple postulate, a so-called past hypothesis to the effect that the world first came into being in whatever particular low entropy macro condition it is that the normal inferential procedures of cosmology are eventually going to present to us. The business of working this thought out in detail is a large undertaking which is still very much in its infancy and which is still a topic of very lively debate and I don't want to attempt anything along the lines of an overview of that project here. All I want to talk about today is a widespread and fundamental and perennial sort of puzzlement about how it is that such a project could even seriously be entertained. A puzzlement, that is, about how it is that the macro condition of the universe 15 billion years ago, all by itself, could even imaginably be up to the job of explaining so much about the feel today and on Earth of the passing of time. The puzzlement takes a number of different forms and arises in a number of different contexts. On the most trivial level, there's a question of how the lowness of the entropy of the world 15 billion years ago can impose any genuinely profound and vivid constraints, whatever, on what the world is doing now. And all that needs to be said in order to make that sort of puzzlement go away is that although 15 billion years is a long time, the entropy of the universe at that time was very, very low, and that in particular, 15 billion years is a great deal shorter than the, expecta than the expected relaxation time of the state in which our universe seems to have started out. But there's a somewhat more interesting question in the general vicinity of this first one about the, how the lowness of the entropy of the world 15 billion years ago can have any genuinely profound and vivid effects or impose any genuinely profound and vivid constraints on what particular localized human scale quasi isolated subsystems of the world are doing now. There's a worry in particular that runs like this. Let it be stipulated that the standard Boltzmannian arguments do indeed establish that the overall entropy of a universe which starts out in a low entropy past hypothesis sort of macro state is overwhelmingly likely to rise toward the future. People are fond of pointing out that this tells us nothing at all in and of itself and considered as a purely logical matter about the behaviors of the entropies of quasi-isolated subsystems of the world. Just as the fact that dogs can run tells us nothing at all in and of itself and considered as a purely logical matter about whether or not dogs' heads can run. 
And it is the behavior of quasi-isolated subsystems of the world, after all, and not the universe as a whole, that the science of thermodynamics is primarily, and in the first instance, concerned with. And all of this, considered as a purely logical matter, is surely true. But it seems to me to ignore or to overlook or to misunderstand how the Boltzmannian arguments actually work. The core of what the Boltzmannian tradition has given us is a general strategy for assigning specific numerical probabilities to any propositions whatsoever about the macro conditions of isolated thermodynamic systems at any time t greater than t0 given the macro condition of the system at t0. And the argument to the effect that the thermodynamic systems in non-equilibrium macro conditions, excuse me, the argument to the effect that thermodynamic um, systems in non-equilibrium macro conditions are overwhelmingly likely to increase their entropies as time goes forward is simply an application of that general strategy to the special case of entropy. The business of actually calculating those probabilities in physically interesting cases is usually going to be prohibitively complicated. But what Boltzmann and his various collaborators and inheritors are widely thought to have made plausible is that those probabilities are in good accord with, what the, enti with the entirety of our everyday thermodynamic experience. If, for example, the isolated system in question consists of two gases which are initially at different temperatures and which are in thermal contact with one another, what the Boltzmannian arguments make plausible is not merely that the overall entropy of this system is likely to go up towards the future, but in addition that the entropy of the hotter gas is overwhelmingly likely to go down toward the future. And if the isolated system in question consists of, say, 12 isolated gases in 12 separate containers, each of which is initially far from its own individual equilibrium state, then what the Boltzmannian arguments are going to make plausible is not merely that the overall entropy of this system is overwhelmingly likely to go up towards the future, but in addition that the separate entropies of each of those 12 gases are all individually overwhelmingly likely to go up toward the future. Of course, the probability that the entropy of some particular one of those gases goes down toward the future will be much larger than the probability that the overall entropy of the 12 of them together goes down toward the future. But both of those probabilities are going to be fantastically small. Good. Then there's a third question in the general vicinity of these first two. Um, and this is the deeper and more interesting and more amorphous um, and more subtle form of the puzzlement about the Boltzmannian project um, that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. And it's this third question that I want to mainly focus on today. Let me put the question in four increasingly concrete and increasingly simple and increasingly tractable ways. One, how can it seriously be imagined that my own sense of the passage of time, how can it seriously be imagined, for example, that my own sense right here and right now of whether some particular baseball happens to be flying towards me or away from me is somehow anchored to the lowness of the entropy of the universe 15 billion years ago. Second form, how can it be, how can it work that the increase of the entropy of the world or of myself somehow constitutes the standard or the yardstick against which I judge the direction in which events are unfolding? How is it, that is, that the entropy gradient of anything ever comes into the picture? I'm certainly not aware of checking on the entropy gradient of anything in the course of deciding whether the baseball is flying towards me or away from me. No comparison with anything else, insofar as I'm consciously aware, is involved. I simply directly, unmediatedly see that the baseball is either flying towards me or away from me. 
third form of the question. Consider the sense of the direction of time that's implicit in the operations of, for example, a simple mechanical realization of a Turing machine. Can anyone seriously believe, that's the second, that I, I've been quoted saying that phrase earlier in this conference. Um, can, I seem to have a tendency to say it a lot. Can anyone seriously believe that thermodynamical characteristics of the world somehow play a role in the way a machine like that distinguishes between what it has just done and what it's supposed to do next? How? How can that be? How would that work? Machines like that can apparently function perfectly well. Machines like that apparently have no trouble at all in distinguishing between what they have just done and what they are to do next without the aid of special devices for measuring the entropy gradient of the world or of themselves or anything else. Fourth form of the question, and this will be the most concrete one and the most tractable one. Um, consider, finally, a simple mechanical device which has no other business than reliably distinguishing between what it has just done and what it's supposed to do next. The paradigmatic distinguisher, the distinguisher par excellence between what it has just done and what, it is to, what it's to do next. Think that is of a clock and think for the sake of concreteness, for the sake of simplicity, of an old-fashioned, fully mechanical pendulum clock. Good. Now we have our hands on something which we're in a position to analyze in detail. Note, to begin with, that in the course of the normal and intended operations of a clock like that, there are going to be moments, moments in particular when the pendulum is precisely at the apogee of its swing, when every last one of its macroscopic moving parts is completely at rest. Note, to put it slightly differently, that in the course of the normal and intended operations of a clock like that, there are going to be moments, the moments again, when the pendulum is precisely at the apogee of its swing, when the, mic when the macro condition of the clock, in its entirety, is invariant under time reversal. And consider how it is, at such moments, that the clock manages to distinguish between what it's just done and what it's supposed to do next. The macro condition of the clock, together with the microscopic dynamical equations of motion, together with the statistical postulate, is manifestly not going to do the trick. For if the present macro condition of the clock, together with the microscopic dynamical equations of motion and the statistical postulate, makes it likely <coughs> excuse me, that the clock is going to read, say, 3.05, five minutes from now. And if the present macro condition of the clock is invariant under time reversal, then the present macro condition of the clock together with the microscopic dynamical equations of motion and the statistical postulate, both of which are invariant under time reversal as well, is necessarily also going to make it likely, and likely to exactly the same degree that the clock read 3.05 five minutes ago. And all there is to break the symmetry all there is that stands in the way of the clocks having read 3.05 five minutes ago, I submit, is the past hypothesis. The clock's ability to distinguish between what it did last and what it does next, and your ability to distinguish between a baseball's flying towards you and a baseball's flying away from you, is anchored in the entropy gradient of the universe. If we were to hold the present macro condition of the world fixed and move the past hypothesis from the beginning of time to its end, the clock would run backwards. Period. Case closed. End of story. But the fact is that people sometimes find it hard to take this in. Here, for example, is the reaction of an anonymous referee to an earlier version um, of this paper. Um, I have reasons for suspecting 
that this referee is a, is a well-known theoretical physicist, but, but I won't go into that um, in any more detail. Here is how the referee reacted <coughs> to an earlier version of the paper um, that ended just about here. Um, here's what the referee says. It's uncharacteristic of Albert to pass over details. He could have described how a pendulum clock works, e.g. falling weight version, in a couple of minutes, but he didn't. The mechanism cannot run backwards. What drives it is the falling of the weight pulling on the cord. If there's no pull on the cord, the clock stops. If there's push on the cord, the clock stops. It'll only work if there's tension in the cord that will make the hands move clockwise because of the way the cord is wound around the drive axle. And that would be true even if the weight rose into the air and started pulling upwards. Putting the low entropy in the future of the universe can't make the clock run backwards, as he claims. The clock knows which way to go, if it's going to go at all, because the information is built into it in the way that the cord is wound around the axle. And this, I think, is worth pausing over and thinking about. Let me begin by simply reiterating the very general point I made a second ago. The referee must be mistaken somewhere. No further details about the inner workings of the clock can possibly make the slightest bit of difference here. Consider, again, a moment when the macroscopic state of the clock is stationary. Consider, that is, a moment when the macroscopic state of the clock is invariant under a reversal of all of the velocities of its microscopic particulate constituents. In the absence of a past hypothesis, the predictions of statistical mechanics about the evolution of the macroscopic condition of this clock away from that moment toward the future are going to be identical to its predictions about the evolution of its macroscopic condition away from that moment toward the past for the simple reason that there is nothing whatever in the situation to distinguish between them. In the absence of a past hypothesis, the predictions of statistical mechanics are in particular that as we proceed away from the present in either temporal direction, the cord is always going to be unwinding and the weight is always going to be going down and the hands of the clock are always going to be turning in the clockwise direction. And it's only because of the truth of the past hypothesis. It can only be because of the truth of the past hypothesis that as a matter of actual fact, those hands turn counterclockwise as we proceed away from the present in the direction of the past. And that, again, is why a clock like this can be used, just as we might use a half-dispersed puff of smoke or a half-melted block of ice as an indicator of the temporal direction in which the entropy of the universe as a whole is increasing. Good. But notwithstanding all that, there's a puzzle here. <clears throat> Consider a half-dispersed puff of brightly colored smoke in an otherwise empty, transparent, cubical container. The entropy of this puff of smoke is going to be a relatively simple, monotonically increasing function of its volume. And here, by the way, I'm talking about Boltzmann entropy, not Gibbs entropy, which we've discussed earlier here. The entropy of this puff of smoke is going to be a relatively simple, monotonically increasing function of its volume. So we can determine the temporal direction in which the entropy of this puff of smoke is increasing by simply noting the temporal direction in which its volume is increasing. And what that means, since the temporal direction in which the entropy of this puff of smoke is increasing is overwhelmingly likely to coincide with the temporal direction in which the entropy of the universe as a whole is increasing, is that we can determine the temporal direction in which the entropy of the world as a whole is increasing by noting the temporal direction in which this brightly colored puff of smoke uh, the volume of this brightly colored puff of smoke is increasing. You might say that the smoke, that the puff of smoke wears its entropy and by extension the entropy of the world as a whole on its sleeve or on its face. 
And look at how utterly different everything is with the clock. We can determine the temporal direction in which the entropy of the world is, as a whole is increasing, or at any rate, we're convinced that we can determine the temporal direction in which the entropy of the world as a whole is increasing by noting the temporal direction in which the clock hands are moving clockwise. But how does that work? The entropy of the puff of smoke, remember, is a relatively simple and monotonically increasing function of its volume. But the entropy of the clock is no function at all of the position of its hands. And the reason that we can determine the temporal direction in which the entropy of the world is increasing by noting anything at all about the smoke is that the smoke is in thermodynamic disequilibrium. The reason we can determine the temporal direction in which the entropy of the world is increasing by noting anything at all about the smoke is that the smoke is undergoing a process of dissipation. But clockmakers invariably go to a great deal of trouble precisely in order to eliminate any potential sources of dissipation, any rubbing or scratching or denting or heating or what have you from the clocks they produce. And if I open up a pendulum clock and examine its inner workings, I find nothing that looks as if it's been designed to measure the volume or the temperature or the pressure of anything. I find nothing, that is, that looks as if it's been designed to track some process of thermodynamic equilibration. So what the hell is going on here? How does the increase in the entropy of the world or of the clock or of anything at all even get into the picture here? How does any of that ever become relevant to the direction in which the clock hands are turning? That's the puzzle, and that, I think, is what, the refer is what has the referee so confused. And it is, indeed, on the face of it, confusing. Let's have a look, then, at the inner workings of the sort of pendulum clock that the referee has in mind. And this is my one cool slide. Um, good. So let's have a look at the inner workings of the sort of pendulum clock that the referee has in mind, which is pictured here. Note that the cord to which the weight is attached it's w is wound around the axle in the clockwise direction so that the axle itself and the clock hands that are attached to it rotate in the clockwise direction as the weight descends. The rest of the mechanism, the pendulum and the escapement, this, this um, uh, gear and uh, uh, that stuff up there is called an escapement in a clock. Um, the rest of the mechanism, the pendulum and the escapement, are apparently there simply in order to regulate the rate at which the axle rotates. If they weren't there, the axle and the clock hands that are attached to it would rotate more and more quickly as the weight accelerated under the influence of gravitation towards the floor. What the pendulum and the escapement do um, on the face of it is to set a limit, call it theta, on the angle through which the axle is able to turn over the course of any single swing of the pendulum. What happens in a little more detail is this. We begin with the macro state depicted in this picture. The pendulum is at the apogee of its rightward swing. As it begins to swing towards the left, the little, metal, the little red metal tab on the left is lifted out of the way. Yes, the little metal, uh, red metal tab on the left is lifted out of the way of gear tooth number one, and the weight is able to exert an uncanceled torque on the axle pulling it in the clockwise direction. As the pendulum swings toward the left, the little red metal tab on the right is lowered into the path of gear tooth number two, and the ensuing collision stops the rotation of the axle dead in its tracks, where it's held fast by the pressure of the weight until the pendulum, until the pendulum begins to swing back towards the right. As the pendulum swings toward the right, the little red metal tab on the left is lowered into the path of gear tooth number three, and the ensuing collision stops the rotation of the axle dead in its tracks, where it is held fast by the pressure of the weight, and the process begins again. 
And what the referee seems to have overlooked, and this is the heart of the matter, is that all of this critically depends on the occurrence at every swing of the pendulum of phenomena like denting and scraping and heating in the operations of the escapement. For suppose that no such things, no denting or scraping or heating ever did occur. Suppose in particular that the collisions between the gear tooths in the little red metal tabs uh, excuse me, suppose in particular that the collisions between the gear tooths and the little red metal tabs were perfectly elastic. We begin again with the macro state depicted in the picture. The pendulum is at the apogee of its rightward swing. As it begins to swing toward the left, the little red metal tab on the left is lifted out of the way of gear tooth number one, and the weight is able to exert an uncancelled torque on the axle, pulling it in the clockwise direction. As the pendulum swings toward the left, the little red metal tab on the right is lowered into the, gear path, is lowered into the path of gear tooth number two, and in the ensuing elastic collision, the clock tooth will bounce off the metal tab and the axle will completely retrace its previous clockwise rotation in the, in the counterclockwise direction, at the end of which the little red tab on the left will be smoothly reunited in exactly the configuration shown in the picture with clock tooth number one. And then, of course, the whole process will simply begin again and the axle will turn clockwise by theta and then counterclockwise uh, and then counterclockwise by theta and then clockwise by theta and then counterclockwise by theta and so on forever and the clock will be rendered utterly incapable of distinguishing between the past and the future good let's take one more look then with all that in mind at the words of the anonymous referee the referee says, putting the low entropy in the future of the universe can't make the clock run backwards. As he, that is me, claims, the clock knows which way to go, if it's going to go at all, because of the information that is built into it in the way that the cord is wound around the axle. Well, let's see. Something is plainly right to begin with about the claim that the clock knows which way to go, if it's going to go at all, because the information is built into it in the way that the cord is wound around the axle. If the cord were wound around the axle in the opposite direction, after all, the axle would plainly turn in the opposite direction. But turn with respect to what? With respect to the temporal direction that we have arbitrarily and as a matter of pure convention labeled with a plus sign? How could that be? With respect to the temporal direction that's picked out by some fundamental metaphysical arrow of time, which makes no appearance whatever in the laws of physics, how could that be? What must be the case, and what we ought to have seen all along, and what we have just now managed to spell out in full mechanical detail is that the information that is built into the way the cord is wound around the axle is information about which way to turn with respect to the entropy gradient of the escapement. What must be the case, and what we ought to have seen all along, and what we have just now managed to spell out in full mechanical detail, is that the information that's built into the way that the cord is wound around the axle is information about which way to turn with respect to the temporal direction away from the Big Bang, away from the past hypothesis. And we can now see, in particular, that in the absence of dissipation, and notwithstanding the particular way that the cord happens to be wound around the axle, a clock like that is going to have no clue which way to turn. We can now see, to put it slightly differently, that in the absence of dissipation, and notwithstanding the particular way that the cord happens to be wound around the axle, the macroscopic evolution of a clock like this, not merely the laws of that evolution, mind you, but the evolution itself, is going to be completely invariant under time reversal. 
Suppose, for example, that we were shown a movie of the operations of a clock like the one we've just now been talking about, turning clockwise by theta and then counterclockwise by theta and then clockwise by theta and so on ad infinitum. Nothing about the sequence of images with which we are presented and nothing in particular about the way that the cord happens to be wound around the axle is going to tell us anything at all about whether the movie is being run forwards or in reverse. So, it's perfectly true that clockmakers take great pains to eliminate every imaginable source of dissipation from the mechanisms they produce. And they're perfectly right to do so. But it is also true, and it is a beautiful and ironical and surprising feature of the way the world actually turns out to work, that if they were ever to perfectly succeed, their clocks would be perfectly useless. And to make a long story short, I suspect that something very much along these lines must explain how a typical mechanical realization of a Turing machine knows the difference between what it did last and what it does next. And it seems to me that once all this has been taken on board, the atmosphere of mystery around my own ability to sense the difference between a baseball flying towards me and a baseball flying away from me, to sense it, mind you, immediately and without any conscious act of inference and without my being aware of ever checking on the entropy of anything, that atmosphere of mystery seems to me to entirely melt away. Thanks. Some means for question, comments? Yeah, sorry. Just a quick thing. There's a picture that it's easy to get into in which you're a soul outside of the universe, mm -hmm. looking at time going past, looking at the clock going past. And of course, from that perspective, you, this is a complete puzzle. It's only once you get yourself into the universe and realize you're part of things that you have to be subject to the laws of the universe that this all comes together. Wait, what's a complete puzzle when you're outside of the if universe? If you're outside of the universe, you wonder, what makes the clock go one way? You know, the clock is just going back and forth and back and forth. You see time passing. You might even notice that one end of the universe is as low entropy as the other high entropy. Right. There may even be a, 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 the clock is clicking in that direction. Right. But so what? You're interested in clock time and time passing. But so my point is that there's a picture that at least some philosophers come to think about time with from, from outside the universe, which it seems to me could have been behind what your referee had in mind. Um, Probably wasn't a philosopher. But they, they, I, I don't they, think they, it was they, they that it was a philosopher, but I, 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 I'm not sure I completely understand what you're saying. I mean, certainly a god looking from outside of the universe is not going to be in any puzzlement about why the clock hands are rotating in the direction they are. Um, that is, why it's rotating counterclockwise in the direction that goes away, or clockwise in the direction that goes away from the past hypothesis, and counterclockwise in the direction that goes towards well, it. Why is telling time? You, I mean, I, if what you mean by time is, if, if you, what you mean by forwards time is this direction, away from the past hypothesis, then this God is not going to be in any puzzlement. No, but that's not the way... Oh, okay, I sure, right. I, ah, I see I what you're saying. It's meant to be a helpful yeah, yeah, yeah. These, about what somebody might come to right, the right, subject. Right, right, right. There, there is this idea that we're plugged into a direction of time in some much more direct and more mysterious way. And right, I agree 100%. What these remarks are intended to do is, is deny that and remove any of the mystery about, about how we know what to do next or how the clock knows what to do next or whatever. Right. And Carl? <clears throat> so I just want to understand better um, how you're thinking this is connected to the past hypothesis. And so it, would it be possible to have this 
pendulum in a, in a universe with no Big Bang. It just you know, God creates a planet to give us gravity. God puts the pendulum clock on the planet, and it does its thing. So, but we still have friction and all that stuff. If that is a possible world, then why do I need this initial condition of the Big Bang? No, I don't understand. With all that, suppose that, um, su well, um, suppose that God stipulates, okay, that the macro condition of the world at a certain moment is this, okay? And then we, we've got scraping and denting and heating and so on and so forth. Um, um, and by virtue of all that, what statistical mechanical, what statistics, the, the clock at this point reads 3 p.m., okay? Um, and what statistical mechanics is going to tell us is that five minutes in one temporal direction, the clock is going to read, so that is, suppose that it's the case that what statistical mechanics tells us is that five minutes away from now in one temporal direction, the clock is going to read 3.05, okay? Then the claim is necessarily statistical mechanics is also going to predict that five minutes in the other direction, the clock also reads 3.05, okay? Precisely because there's nothing in the description of the world or in the laws to distinguish between those two directions in the kind of world that you're, that, that you're setting up here. So yeah, we have this denting and scraping and dissipation. It operates perfectly symmetrically. I mean, this is just, this is just an example applied to this clock of this very general claim you see all the time when anybody talks about Boltzmann, about you have a non-maximal entropy state here, you trace its evolution in either temporal direction, there are going to be mirror images of one another, okay? Um, um, Precisely so if the macro state, precisely so on the macro level, if the macro state at the bottom is invariant under time reversal, as this one is, okay? So that's, that's all that's happening here, right? So yeah, we've got this denting and scraping, we've got this dissipation, okay? Without a past hypothesis, it's going to operate in exactly the same way towards the past as towards the future. Maybe. I mean, you've mostly just said it, but I was just checking. I, I, I have the logic of this that um, if the macro state itself is invariant, right, and downstream of that, therefore, if the probability distribution that's relevant over micro states is invariant at the time reversal, which right. requires the macro state to be invariant, otherwise it'd be zapped over here. Exactly. In that case, because the laws of physics are time reversal invariant, right. obviously the probability distribution over to right. has to be time reversal. Right. 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 So that seems confusing. Right. Right. But if I just had a blob of fluid that happened to be going that way. Sure. Of course. Well, sure. The question is, if you have a blob of fluid going that way, it's going to be going the other way. Then there's going to be a, deta a more detailed question about, okay, which interesting features are going to be different uh, when, you know, when you look in the other temporal direction and which aren't. Um, that's going to depend on which features you're interested in. We've kept things simple here by choosing a moment in the operations of this clock when it's fully invariant under time reversal. And I suppose if I happen to catch the clock in a macro state, it isn't like that, like when the pendulum is moving. Right. At that point, I might have quite strong inferential reasons to think, um, to stop this being about a weird coincidence, there's probably an error of time somewhere there. No, there's going to be a funny thing. I mean, I mean, so let me say a couple of things. First of all, in the non-dissipative case, it's not going to matter where you catch it, okay? It's going to keep going backwards and forwards. Yeah. In, the, in the dissipative case, in the, in the standard case of real clocks, if you catch it somewhere in the middle, um, but without a past hypothesis, and, and project it backwards and forwards, it's going to like break. It's going to do yeah. weird, it's going to do weird stuff. But okay. I mean, which is maybe this is a bit artificial, but if I knew there was a past hypothesis at one end of time or the other, and yes. I call the clock in motion, I can yes. work out which end it's Correct. Yeah. That's right. No, that's that's the whole point. Yeah. Right. right. That's the whole that that's what these clocks do. Astonish you know, that is that's where we started out. Okay. How could a clock know in which direction the past hypothesis is? Just like this. Okay. Okay, is there any other comment, question?
But I have something to say. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think that I already know the, the, the answer, but just to, to be sure. I mean, you have been telling us this story in which the club is just running away from the past hypothesis, right? But everything is terrible, so important. So I, I, I can imagine that there is a possible world in which there is a time reverse David Albert telling the same story about the future hypothesis, but clocks just running away from the, from the future hypothesis. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you have the future hypothesis in this I, I, it's not obvious to me that that's a different world, um, um, but okay, but, okay, but let, let's assume that it is. Let's assume that there's some okay. metaphysical temporal direction relative to which we can judge yeah, the I mean, difference. Yeah, I mean, for, for our world, I mean, right. Observationally, it's more or less symbol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there is no difference. Yeah, but yeah. When when you say no, no, no. Let's just hypothesis then reverse. Uh, yeah, yeah. Says future hypothesis. Fine. And then you meet each other and you say, okay, where's the direction of time? And you are pointing the opposite direction. They meet each other? They communicate okay, with each other? Okay, let's imagine that they can meet each other. Or the, or no, 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 but now, now things are going to get much more complicated. Or they can know that there's, uh, I don't know, time reverse to be solved, are saying that the future hypothesis But the they can know it observationally? Well, no, no observationally. Okay, but it was still some uh, uh, mental thing. Uh, you know, no matter what anybody says, you say, this is what I was saying. <laughs> he has the picture in his head. Yeah. And I was saying that people come to this, uh -huh. where you could be outside the universe and you see time flowing one way or the other. Yeah, also to say that they just... You don't meet each other, but God knows that there are two guys just opposite. Oh, it, for God. Okay, good. Then, then it okay, is what Barry is. But that's fine. What do you mean, which is the direction of time? There's one direction of time in the universe with the past hypothesis here. Yeah. There's a there's a counter directed yeah, okay. direction of time in the in the universe with the past okay. hypothesis okay. there. Yeah, God can look at both of them. Okay. There's no problem. But so the the, the difference between these two uh, worlds is just a semantic distinction. I mean, they are calling past hypothesis, future hypothesis, but it's just a convention. Like I mean, we could, I, mean, I don't understand. Time, right? We could have, we, we, we could imagine a situation mm -hmm. in which there are two, you know, a classical situation, mm -hmm. okay, in which there are two huge, you know, universe-sized clumps of matter, okay, but they're very far apart from one another, they're causally isolated from mm -hmm. one another. One has an entropic direction of time running in this yeah. direction, one has an entropic direction of yeah, time. There's a David Albert in each of them giving yeah. this lecture, yeah. what's the problem? The yeah. uh, I, I don't see the problem. If you, if you now allow them to physically interact with one another, Things are going to get much yeah, yeah, more so complicated. You're, yeah, you're right on that. Yeah, but I, again, I mean, my point was that the difference between these two worlds is going to be just a semantic difference. They are just calling. Yeah, I think I think from the inside that they're, they're, they're going to feel the, the they phenomenology is okay. going to be exactly yeah, the same. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah, uh, right. Uh, I wonder if this kind of question can ever happen in sort of another direction where. We imagine that 15.8 billion years from now the universe is equilibriated and there aren't any more any clocks that are telling us in which direction is the right. special initial condition. Right, right. But there is a certain sense in which there's still an arrow ever so slightly in that one out of every 500 neutral chaos decays are time reversal by Right, order. right. And so there's this ever so subtle little direction of time that mm. does tell you where the past hypothesis is even in that environment? Well, let's see, I'm not sure, that's a good question. Um, is there a reason to think that, um, that, that, suppose I define the K on decay arrow in some particular way, I, is there any reason to think that some particular um, way of defining the K on decay arrow is, is gonna be aligned with the entropic arrow? Maybe not. I mean, it's, this is an open, there's some open physics in this question, in my view. We were talking about this last night, but uh, only in the sense that when t, when t violation happens and CP violation happens in the very early universe, right. then that does give rise to, you know, sort of various asymmetries that can be amplified as gravitation proceeds. And huh. so, one, you know. So that's a good, I, I've never thought about sort of the question. Uh, that's a good question. 
and 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 I don't uh, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. That's a nice question. I've never thought about how you know how the time asymmetry and weak interactions might get involved with the with the entropic asymmetry. I'm guilty of the usual sort of um, um, just uh, no doubt too simple thought. It's a negligible it's a negligible effect. Don't worry about it. But that's a good question. Uh, maybe from it. I'm, ner I'm nervous about it because if it's still K on the K, then I'm not that living. I mean, maybe actually K is a thermodynamic related process. <laughs> uh, well, it depends on how. I guess, so you view K on right. as a thermal as a thermal phenomenon. I mean, I view it as the matter of the laws of physics. Right, but there's a time reverse of K on the K, where sure. a bunch of K on the K products are coincidentally in poor K on. Yeah, maybe that decay is not, an, it's not, it's not that kind of, it's, it's, a, it's that kind of macro process that has a, I mean, that even, even if it, you know, take, take a thing that doesn't violate the or something, if I've got a decaying uh, hydrogen atom or something, excited hydrogen atom or something, the fact that it decays and sends out decay products and doesn't spontaneously be formed from any kind of decay products. But, that well, that okay, you're putting it in a secret yeah. way, but I mean, I guess I would have thought of it as the unitary evolution of the universe you know, plays a canon that is a little slower in one direction than it is in the other. So in a sense, that is, and we're talking now about the probability of, the, of, of a given decay occurring. Uh, so it's, you know, the, the unitary evolution is irreversible, the laws are irreversible uh, in a sense that just strikes me as quite different from whether or not a system's in equal right, but, I, but I'm saying whether, whether, or not, whether or not there's a direction in the place of decay, if the universe is at equilibrium, there are exactly as many k on other k as there are k on k. We don't need to have that scenario. We can have a future hypothesis scenario. <laughs> and the question is then, would we see the other asymmetry, right? What would people, yeah. if, if the two arrows weren't aligned, right. would it be something unphysical, or would we just live in exactly the same world that we observe k on k as a cause of the other direction? Right? The fact that the language is conventional, I mean, you could right. decide it to declare. Right. You know, the, the, fact that we've decided, the fact that we've decided the arrow time to find the candor to decay points in that direction. Yeah. That's yes, of convention. course, yes. yes. Sure, sure, sure. But could we, is there a possible world which we get the count? That's a, yeah, yeah, that's the other way. way. If, if, apparently, if we replace every, you know, if we do at the same time the, the CP thing, and our world was predominantly you know, dominated by antimatter and yeah, yeah, so yeah. forth. Then we would have had a world that we started from very similar conditions just with antimatter, and the K and R of time would work in the opposite direction, and, but the thermodynamic R of time would work in the same. Yeah. Kevin, that was your question. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm just I'm extremely sympathetic to this, but I'm just sort of seeing where I can push against it. Um, I, I mean, try this. The, 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 the most neutral thing I can conclude from thinking about the, the clock is that there has to be, the, 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 the appropriate dynamics for the system has to be dissipative, as you say, it's got, it has to scratch and dent, otherwise it doesn't work. So there's an arrow, of, there's, a, there's a locally accessible dissipation arrow of time, right. which I can also see in the melting of ice or something, right. which must be aligned with the, the, the clock right. arrow of time. But I, and, and, and then, of course, it's very plausible if I have a, a microphysics that's time reversal variant that I'm going to need to track that back to a condition to a family condition of some kind. Um, but I guess presumably this is compatible with, for instance, there being symmet symmetric past the future hypotheses where the idea is we reach a prolonged period of equilibrium and then head back. Oh, sure. Yeah, and it's presumably also oh, sure. compatible with... No, 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 it's a question of the local entropy yeah, gradient. And, and, and presumably of course. it's also compatible with something where I've got, I mean, it's going to depend on the details, but in principle where I've got a local source of dissipativeness is being magnified up from some fundamental equations Direction of time, like some kind of theory, if you set it up right. Um, maybe. I'm not saying I mean, it, you know, a particular theory will do that, but there's no right. I, I don't think the GRW theory, for example, that, that is, I think the GRW theory has really interesting impacts on statistical mechanics if it were true, okay? Um, I think if it were true, you would be able to do away with a statistical hypothesis, a, a statistical postulate. That is, I believe that if a theory like GRW were true, you're going to be able to prove the following as a theorem, okay? Um, um, that, that it's the case not merely for uh, the overwhelming, so 
take a, a, an unmelted ice cube sitting on the floor, right? And you ask, why does it melt? Okay, and the standard answer is because in the overwhelming majority of microstates compatible with that macrostate, um, there you're sitting on a trajectory uh, that's going to take you to a melted state ten minutes down the road, right? If something like GRW were true, I believe the following would be the case. It would be true to say not only of the overwhelming majority of microstates compatible with that macrostate, and not even of a set of measure one of microstates compatible with that macrostate, but for every microstate compatible with that macrostate, there will be a high probability of the ice being melted 10 minutes down the road. Okay, so in this case, it's simply not going to matter at all to the explanation of the melting of the ice what probability distribution you put over microconditions compatible with that macro condition or whether you put any probability distribution at all over microconditions compatible with that macro condition. So um, in that sense, I think it's going to have a very prof it would have a very profound effect on statistical mechanics if it turned out to be true. Um, um, but I don't think it would eliminate the need for a past hypothesis. And, and I don't think it would help at all to explain why, as you go backwards, the clock goes counterclockwise. Let me try pushing on that a little bit. I mm -hmm. mean, suppose I've got, I've got my Mac mistake when it's clock is instantaneously stationary. Right. So the vast majority of trajectories through that Mac mistake are turning around trajectories mm -hmm. that are dissipative into the future right. and anti-dissipative into the past. Right. But now if I introduce GRW, the consequence of GRW, I mean, this is a little heuristic, but the consequence of GRW um, uh, dynamics seems to be that if I'm on a dissipative trajectory, I'm probably going to get bounced to another dissipative trajectory. Right. If I'm on an anti-dissipative trajectory, I'm going to get bounced to a dissipative trajectory. Correct. So it can't be in a GRW theory that actually the overwhelming majority of dynamical trajectories... No, no, I think what happens in a GRW theory, and this is standard with, with chancy, th you know, um, theories, theories with a stochastic dynamics, okay, are uh, typically have, typically give you transition probabilities in one temporal direction and not in the other, okay. So I think, I think, I think just the dynamics of GRW, you give it this macro state. I agree with you. It's not going to give you the mirror image. It's going to be completely agnostic about the past. Yes. You're going to need priors, okay, about the past in order to get any inferences yeah, toward the true. past. So it's going to tell me with certainty the clock's going to run forward. But right. Got to let know what's right. Past. Exactly Absent right. Absent Ex yeah. Okay. That's not good. Exactly right. Exactly right. Very, very short. And just to to clarify, like the puzzling issue. If I remove these dents and I remove you remove the, what the dents in the wheel. Oh, you mean the teeth? The teeth. Yeah, you remove the, the teeth. The yeah. teeth and, yeah. and, and, the, and the reddish uh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it will become very, um, a, a clock that will be useful for very short. Correct. The thing falls down. Yeah. I mean, and it's not good in It will turn in this direction. And then the puzzle will be solved by saying, well, this condition in which the the, the rope was winded around the, the, the axis is the very unusual special condition and I can trade no, it. No, 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 no. I don't think that's right. No. So what will happen um, then? Um, you give me, so you remove the teeth, you remove the pendulum, um, um, you've just got the clock hands attached to this wheel. Yeah. Okay, wait, so wait. So you give me an initial condition, okay, which is macroscopically stationary, which is macroscopically time reversible, okay? Um, the, the, the weight um, is up here, the thing is all wound up, okay? And it has zero velocity at the moment, okay? That's the condition of the world, okay? Good. You do statistical mechanics on that, okay? Um, um, you make inferences forwards and backwards, they're going to be symmetrical. It's going to be overwhelmingly likely that the weight, that this thing was turning this way a minute ago and the weight is coming up. Mm. 
That's what's going to be overwhelmingly likely without a past hypothesis. Okay, so the past hypothesis would come in in saying, you know, this arrangement that you find it. Right, this arrangement was not preceded by that. That's yes. right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Hey, perfect. Many thanks, David. Sure.